There we are. And as we welcome uh, Pat in just a moment here, our opening question, hopefully everybody got the questions uh, to email to Good them. Morning. But if you didn't, uh, I'll be, I'll be uh, sharing them out loud. So our opening question is, when you were young, how did your parents correct you for making mistakes? And how did they show you they still loved you? Or if you prefer, how did you do this for your children? If you have children, uh, you can think of that way. I guess I always tried to make a distinction with my kids between not liking their behavior, but I still love you as a person and tried to distinguish those two elements. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Pat. Can you hear us? I can, I can. Good. Can you, um, okay. I used to um, try and find a punishment that didn't punish me as well. <laughs> there were there were always those times when you you know when you said oh you have you can't do thus and so but mm, it wasn't so good for me because you couldn't do thus and so yeah i'm gonna take away all your toys for the next day well guess who's gonna be really bored yeah that's uh that's that's a punishment for the parent as much as for the <laughs> that's right I can remember when I was a seminary student, I worked in uh, a church in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which uh, is a real place. Uh, I know we hear the name sometimes, but a fun name to say. Um, and, and part of my job as a uh, summer intern there was working with the youth group and the youth leader who was about my age. So we were both in our mid twenties. And uh, when, when one of the kids would do something that wasn't quite right you know maybe they did something that hurt another kid's feelings or something I would just kind of look them straight in the eyes and say don't be stupid don't, don't do that you know but the youth leader you you would get a 45 minute coffee time with Aaron and he would he would go over you know at length why this really wasn't Christian behavior and and how we have to think about you know and how are we going to repent for what we're doing and and don't get me wrong his his approach worked well the kids really did think through why they were doing what they were doing and how that was wrong um but i think they acted they acted well just to avoid the 45 minutes with aaron uh you know it, and so it taught them to avoid that as much as it did to correct their behavior now i'm not saying my approach was right it might have been a little too abrupt for a lot of those kids especially midwesterners weren't used to people just being that forward with them i think <laughs> But we had different approaches to to trying to correct behavior, and and the kids understood that we cared about it no matter what. But uh, we had very different approaches with with how we tried to steer them through that. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, um, you know. And, and some of us have had children. Some of us have helped raise children, even if they weren't our own. All of us were children. So depending on, on how you acted and how your parents acted, we all know about what discipline's like. And we've all been in a school setting too, as children or even as adults, you see different teachers handle disruption different ways, that kind of things. We're gonna talk a little bit about that. And I don't mean to paint the Israelites immediately as children, but we're gonna talk about how God works with the people of Israel uh, before they're in Israel uh, to try and help correct some of the things that are going on with them. So more broadly this week in church, we're going to talk about stewardship and we're talking about rivers. Now, we will not hear the word river. We're not going to talk about water at all in our Bible study this morning. So if you are in this passage and then Sunday we get to things and you're thinking about why are we talking about stewardship of rivers? We were talking about Exodus and the giving of the Ten Commandments. Um, the theme of the service on Sunday, just so spoiler for everybody, is talking about how just like a river, pollution goes downstream and has bigger impacts the later it goes. And uh, 
you know, sometimes in life and in the Bible, we see some actions have bigger ramifications down the road. So that's not going to be the whole sermon, but that's, that's where this passage is going to fit in. It's kind of how one action can lead to another and so on. And how, uh, you know, you see kind of what happens downstream when, when something happens upstream. So we're going to get into things and we're going to turn to Exodus chapter 32 in our Bible. So you, hopefully you have that. And uh, I'm very excited because for the last few weeks, it's been difficult for me to hear when other people read aloud. And I think we'll be able to hear each other when we read aloud today because uh, we, we can see each other's faces a lot better and uh, hear a little more clearly. So would somebody be willing to read from their Bibles, Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 through 6? Sure. Rick, thank you. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what has happened to him. Aaron answered them, take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what they had handed him and made it into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Thank you, Rick. <clears throat> so just in case we weren't sure of the context, Moses is up on the mountain receiving the law, the Ten Commandments from God. What happens while he's there? They party. <laughs> they party. That's that's what ends up happening, Chris. But how do they get to the party? What 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 are the what's the people's concern? That Moses isn't coming back. Right. They tried waiting and didn't have enough trust in him. So it's been forty days, and. I think that it would be good for us to think about how we would feel if our leader who brought us out of our homeland, granted we were slaves there, and we're now in the wilderness, went up on a mountain and said, I'm going to go talk to God and I'll be back. And 40 days later, how would we feel still not knowing where Moses was, the leader, the un unabashed, definite leader? Um, he's been absent. So the people are kind of impatient or skeptical that Moses is still alive might be also part of their thought. Kind of feeling abandoned. Yeah, Rick, perhaps feeling abandoned. If they're feeling abandoned by Moses, Moses is God's instrument. So if they are feeling abandoned by Moses, they're feeling abandoned by God. Who led them yes. into the wilderness. Sorry, Pat, did you? Did you I just said, yeah, yes, they're feeling abandoned by God as well. Yeah, not just Moses, even though Moses is kind of the instrument of that, but but by God too. So then what do they ask Aaron to do? What Mo, Aaron, by the way, just in case we're not familiar, Aaron is Moses' brother, second in charge. They go to Aaron, and what do they ask him to do? Create a new God for them. No. So some scholars have been really kind to the Israelites, and they say, Make us a representation of the Lord while we wait. I don't think that's what's going on. I think, Chris, what you just said is more accurate. They say, we're tired of waiting for God. We don't know if God has abandoned us, so make us some new ones. Make us some new ones. So what's Aaron's solution? Make a new one. <laughs> Give me Gold. your earrings. Yeah. Gold is important. Everyone wants gold it must have an, a god made of gold and they looted the egyptians when they left they took their gold so the israelites have gold and um 
Interestingly, we think that both men and women wore earrings and, and jewelry at that time. There was no distinction that was common around that part of the world. And it even says, give me the gold of your sons and daughters. Um, they, they had a bunch of gold and they gave it to Aaron. And what's Aaron do with it? He makes a golden calf. calf. He makes a golden calf. calf. Now, Rick, I liked your translation. I'm going to read my verse here. Uh, he took the gold from them, formed it into a mold, and cast an image of a calf. Now, Rick's translation said something like he worked it with an engraving tool or something oh, like that. A tool. Yep. That's more accurate. Um, even mine has a little note that says there's an alternate translation. When it says worked it into a mold, it's as if Aaron, like, you know, Aaron worked the image to make it look that way. And the word calf isn't like um, a newborn baby cow. It's like a two-year-old calf. It's like a, if it was a dog, it would be a huge puppy, like who's still too young to know how to control itself, but as strong as anything. Not, not like this little baby puppy, but you know, a juvenile. So, so we're talking about a big bull that's a picture of strength kind of thing, uh, not just like a little calf, but they give Aaron the gold. He complies. He responds to their request. We got. We have an image of a, a cow, a bull, and uh, we got the gold there. Chris, yes. Why did he choose a calf? Good question. Calf is an image. Anybody have any ideas why that may be? Mm. Oh, I have a little note in my study Bible. The calf was probably similar to representations of the Egyptian bull god Apis. So one, they probably know other gods in their region. The Canaanites worship uh, a god that's often depicted riding on the back of a bull. So um, there might be something about they just know that other people worship bulls. So that's a big or gods in the shape of a bull, I should say. They don't worship the bull itself. So that might just be kind of like, well, that's a that's a good animal to represent a god, right? There's often, often uh, so that's one, is that's what everybody else is doing. So we'll have a bull too. <laughs> but there's also a symbolism for what a bull represents. Not a, a baby calf, but a, a bull. What would a bull represent, do you think? Strength, power, Strength. power, power. And fertility. Oh. So those those three things for sure. So, you know, that's why it's important to understand it's not a little calf. I'm talking about a full grown, just right. an adolescent kind of thing. Uh, so this is a strong, powerful, fertile kind of thing. Hello, Chris. Yes, Dick. Chris? Yes, Dick. Yeah, yeah I am, I'm wondering. I'm wondering about Aaron. Where was he? What, what was he doing and getting this gold and making a calf and whatever? Uh, so, he, he was in the. He came to. He was with Moses. He, no, he, he wasn't. He, he came. Moses went up on the mountain, Dick, and Aaron. Aaron stayed behind to kind of um, okay. keep an eye on the people. So okay. Aaron was the leader while Moses was up on the mountain. So Aaron didn't come down. He's been waiting too. Okay. So, so we might give Aaron the benefit of the doubt and say that he didn't know what was going on with Moses either. Okay. So yeah. Aaron, you know, the people say, Aaron, we want this thing. And Aaron says, okay, yeah, give me your gold. We'll make something. Aaron tries a little bit, at least, not to get too far afield in verse 5. Can anybody read me there, verse 5? Donna? When Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So, I mean, he's got the golden calf. He builds an altar to it. But then he says, and now tomorrow we're going to have a party and dedicate it to the Lord. And the Lord is not just 
the calf, the Lord is a special holy name for God, the God of Israelites. So he tries to kind of slip this back in there. Mm -hmm. But we wonder, is it worse to try and include this bull in the worship of God? Or would it be or would it just be better just to to ditch God and worship a bull anyway? So it's like Aaron is combining this bull worship with God's worship. That might be worse than if they just said, we'll choose another God right now. So we're, we're not sure how that all goes, but Aaron seems a little conflicted. He seems to be a people pleaser right now, trying to figure out, ah, how do I just make this work for everybody, right? I'm going to read Exodus verse seven, chapter 32, verse 7 through 24. Here's another part of the story. The Lord said to Moses, go down at once, your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They've been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They've cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshiped it and sacrificed to it and said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them and of you. I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought us them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath. Change your mind and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to keep them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven and all this land that I've promised I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. And, this Lord, and the Lord changed his mind about the disaster he planned to bring on the people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain carrying the two tablets of the covenant in his hands, tablets that were written on both sides, written on the front and the back. The tablets were the work of God and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. When Joshua heard the noise of the people as they shouted, he said, there's a noise of war in the camp. But Moses said, it's not the sound made by victors or the sound made by losers. It's the sound of revelers, I hear. As soon as he came near the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot. And he threw the tablets from his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf they had made, burned it with fire, ground it to powder, scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. Mm -hmm. Moses said to Aaron, what did the people do to you that you brought a great sin upon them? And Aaron said, do not let the anger of my Lord burn hot. You know the people that they're bent on evil. They said to me, make us gods who will go before us. And as for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what's become of him. So I said to them, whoever has gold, take it off. And they gave it to me and I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. So how does God react to what's going on in verses seven through nine? He's upset. God is upset. God sees that the people, after God led them out of Egypt, with miraculous things going on, God sees that the people are already turning away. Very once, upset. <clears throat> once again, we became what we used to all the time before Every time God calls us, and then we slip back. It's like slipping back into old habits, right? Chris? I find it interesting that Moses had so much power that he could change God's mind. And I'm wondering really if God really, if if Moses hadn't talked to God and asked that the people be saved, would God really have gone through with his threat? Um, it just seems like for Moses to have that much power over God perplexed me. This is a good question, Chris. And some scholars say that God had predetermined two outcomes and was waiting to hear back from Moses or one of the people so that God didn't really change God's mind but God already had it in mind, what God wanted to do, but wanted to give Moses kind of a trial. However you want to say it, it seems perplexing and a little troubling that God was bent on something and Moses changed his mind. So 
How does God, how does Moses change God's mind? What's the argument? First of all, interesting in verse 10, God tells Moses, I'll kill them all and I'll make of you a great nation. So instead of being the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, he will be the God of Moses. God will be the God of Moses and all this. What an incredible thing that would be. Moses will be the patriarch of all the people, not Abraham. But Moses says, no, Moses is a shepherd and a pastor first and foremost, which is pretty incredible here. But what's Moses's argument to God, why God shouldn't do this? Just trying to re he reminds God, not that God needs reminding, but that God has promised to be the God of Abraham and all of his descendants. And if he wipes them all out, then God's going back against the word he gave to Abraham. So yes, God, the people have violated the covenant, but that doesn't mean you have to. One verse earlier, verse 12, there's a really interesting argument too. Marcy? Oh, this just reminds me of the story of Noah as well, like with God experiencing like this deep wrath and saying like, I'm just going to kill everyone. And Noah's like, hold on, let's like think about that for a moment. And God changes God's mind then. And then also with this story of Moses too, and just like thinking about how God is wrathful like God does not like, like hates when we sin, hates. We call it, we call it just Marcy. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> there's justice in this. Right. Uh, and I think yes. there's like a, I mean, just like how a parent has, can experience anger when their child is doing something inappropriate. Um, I think there is like some sense of love and justice underneath that. But yeah, that's like a really, interesting point that you know Moses has this like very pastoral kind of heart of remember um remember who you are God um, and we see it in Jonah too when when the Ninevites re repent and all of a sudden God changes God's mind in Jonah too so the 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 great argument though I think Moses must have been a great orator in in uh verse 12 he says but God, if you kill everybody, the Egyptians are going to say you're just mean. That all you did was lead them out of Egypt just to kill them in the mountains. What they you'll get a bad reputation. <laughs> and uh, I think that that's that's a fantastic argument. But Moses says, "But what will other people think, God? What will other people think?" They will uh, trash talk God. <laughs> <laughs> so, an, an interesting argument. Yeah, I mean, Moses being this person who like, he has trouble public speaking, is able to really be very so direct says, right? with, yeah. uh, with God. He's able to be very like, oh, but like, you don't want to be seen as mean. <laughs> and so what does Moses do in verse 19 as a response to what the people are doing? And what significance does that have? Moses got angry yeah. and, and threw the tablets and exercised his wrath rather than God exercising God's wrath. Moses didn't drop the tablets. He threw them. Yeah. This is the literal breaking of the law. This is, this is a very pointed you know, expression of you have violated this and I, I've just come down with these tablets of God's law and you've broken them before I even got them to you. And so how does Moses punish the people in verse 20? This is wild. Yeah. Has the you made them drink the melted gold. I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but I just think the Bible can be just so wild sometimes, like with <laughs> this, like, all right, we're going to be very specific about how Moses is going to like punish the Israelites <laughs> right now. I'm going to make you drink it. <laughs> Years ago, I wrote in the margin of my Bible, Moses is Moses washes their mouth out with gold. <laughs> you know, it's uh, like, yeah, this this gold that you used, he grinds it up and he puts it on the water and he makes them drink it. And uh, that's, 
that's a pretty incredible punishment. But uh, and and we're told from then on, uh, adornment becomes like kind of not part of the Jewish culture. Like after that, they kind of had their issues with gold and they don't do earrings anymore. Um, <laughs> th there's nothing that necessarily, there is a, a quick passage that says something like they kind of stopped doing that after that, but it, it's kind of this lesson they learned. So they had to drink their gold, uh, which is a pretty, yeah, pretty incredible punishment. So now we get to Aaron. What's his great excuse in verses 22 through 24 about what all happened? They made me do it. They made me do <laughs> it. Do it. Oh, and, and what did they make him do? They needed a new leader. Uh, a, a new God. To keep them... Focus. The yeah. They made him create a new God. So Moses, they just gave me all their gold and I threw it in the fire and out yeah. came this calf. I, I don't, you know, I, it was, it was the strangest thing. I don't, I don't yeah. know what happened, you know, Not accepting and, uh, responsibility. Yeah. It's totally passing the buck. Yeah. All I did was throw the gold in the fire. I, I, you know, I, I thought that would be okay, but uh, magical. And then, then the calf came out. So then when that was miraculously a calf, I didn't engrave it or anything like the former verses say that I did. It just came out. And then I thought, oh, maybe God wanted us to have this calf. So we just parted. That's what happened, Moses. You know, uh, quick backtrack on Aaron's part, just kind of trying to justify. He, he's trying to almost add God back into his actions. Like, oh, it must have been God. He, you know, I threw some gold into a fire. That's all I did. Obviously, a little different there. Did not exactly what happened. So, um, would somebody be willing to read twenty-five through thirty-five? Because now, now it takes a turn. <clears throat> I can read that. Thank you, Marcy. When Moses saw that the people were running wild, for Aaron had let them run wild to the. Um, Darison of their enemies. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, who is on the Lord's side? Come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered around him. He said to them, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, put your sword on your side, each of you go back and forth from gate to gate throughout the camp. And each of you kill your brother, your friend and your neighbor. The sons of Levi did as Moses commanded, and about 3,000 of the people fell on that day. Moses said, today you have ordained yourselves for the service of the Lord, each one at the cost of a son or brother, and so have brought a blessing on yourselves this day. On the next day, Moses said to the people, you have sinned a great sin, but now I will go up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now if you will only forgive their sin, but if not, blot me out of the book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot out of my book. But now go, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. See, my angel shall go in front of you. Nevertheless, when day comes for punishment, I will punish them for their sin. Then the Lord sent a plague on the people because they made the calf, the one that Aaron made. So what happens now after the people have been punished by drinking the gold? <clears throat> well, Moses goes back up on the mountain saying, what do I do now? So Moses asks, who's on the Lord's side? And the, the tribe of Levi, which is his tribe. He's part of the tribe of Levi. They come to his side. Does anybody know what the Levites are in the history of Israel? They're kind of the priests. 
They're the priests. And the way they are ordained as priests happens in this passage. They get their special status as God's mediators by doing what? Killing their brothers. But that's what God was going to do that Moses talked him out of. Ah, so where is God's justice in this passage? God's justice was was that the people broke the covenant, so they ceased to be under God's protection. And as Chris says, but it sounds like maybe God did it anyway, even though Moses seemed to talk God out of it. Can you see how this could be merciful? I'm guessing not everybody was killed. So this is a hard golden pill to swallow for us, but um, God's justice requires that when the people break covenant, God, God turns from them. But God's mercy is shown in that only 3,000 of them die. Uh, that's a real hard silver lining to find in the story, but it is part of it that, that yes, uh, 3,000 people died, but not mm-hmm. all of them did. Remember, God said to Moses, I'll kill all of them and reestablish you and your people. And instead, some of them did die. Do, do and, we know how many? Do we know how many Israelites in total there were? So probably, this, Rick. I can't, off the top of my head, pull that number out. But it was in like the hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of okay. <clears throat> um. So this is a large scale punishment, but it's not complete punishment. So uh, why? Moses talked God out of it in the first place. Why didn't he just let God do what he was going to do? Because God wanted Moses wanted to save the people Moses had been leading out of Israel, out of Egypt in the first place. So then why didn't he disobey God when they were told to pull up swords and kill their brothers? But they, that actually wasn't disobeying. That was that was Moses carrying out God's mercy. I, I know that sounds ridiculous. How, how is killing 3,000 people merciful? I'm not asking you to agree with that statement. I'm just saying that that's, that's what it is. Moses is still being the leader there. He knows that the people need to be punished, but he also, he does it in a way that isn't complete and total annihilation, right? And so I this part, go ahead, Chris, sorry. I don't see it as mercy. I see it as God saying, I'm going to show you who's in control. And I'm going to ask you to do something very hard. But you need to learn I'm the final word. So I can I can agree with you on that, Chris. At the same time, God has already told Moses the plan is to eliminate everyone. So if God really wants to show everybody who's in control, that's the way to do it. Except then there would be nobody left. Except for Moses. <laughs> Except for Moses. So instead, 3,000 people died. But then also, it seems like there's something additional at the end here, that a plague happens. We have no idea if that's referring to something through the, through the next generations of Israelites. We don't know any of that. Um, we just know that that the 3,000 people dying, that wasn't the end of it, that there were further repercussions of this. So if we ended the story here, what's your view of the fate of the Israelites? You would think they'd, they'd kind of wise up and say, oh boy, we better go the straight and narrow. You would think. Good thing. They're sort of on a slippery slope here. I'd say, say, it's say more, pretty, Chris. Pretty bleak. Yeah, pretty bleak. <laughs> it was, I mean, if if the story just ended right there, like, yep, and then there was just a plague. They're um, in the wilderness, 
a bunch of them are killed after they turn away from God and then there's a plague. And that's the end of that story of those people who used to live in that place and followed God that was a different God than other people followed. But there's an extra part of this story and uh, I'm not going to say it'll make it all sit better with us, but it, it continues. So we go to Exodus chapter 34. And I would ask for a volunteer to read in Exodus chapter 34, verses 1 through 7. And Donna, I saw your hand before, so I'm going to call on you if that's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> the Lord said to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first one. And I will write on them the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Be ready in the morning and then come up Mount Sinai. Present yourself to me there on top of the mountain. No one is to come with you or be seen anywhere on the mountain. Or even the flocks and herds may graze in front of the mountain. So Moses chiseled out two stone tablets like the first ones, and went up Mount Sinai early in the morning, as the Lord had commanded him. And he carried the two stone tablets in his hands. Um, then the Lord came down in the cloud and stood there with him and proclaimed his name, the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation. Thank you, Donna. What does God ask Moses to do in verses one through five? He, he wants them to prepare the tablets. It's going to be a second set of tablets. Right. And they most. It. It's like, which you broke. <laughs> like, <laughs> which you, which you broke, like right. Throws that in there. <laughs> We're going to do this a second time because you broke the first ones, Moses. Yeah, it wasn't, it, yeah, it wasn't as if uh, Moses yeah, accidentally tripped and dropped the stones. This is like a righteous breaking of the law. Um, uh, why would God do it a second time? Giving a second chance. Well, don't we see God giving it the, the Israelites second chances, like Carol says quite often? And I mean... Moses didn't even get down to the bottom of the mountain with the law before they broke the law. And just so we remember, the Ten Commandments were given before they were written down in the tablets. It's not like the people didn't know. Commandment number one is to have no other gods before me and don't cast any images in my, you know. They knew it. So to say, well, they didn't really know until it was in stone. No, it didn't need to be written in stone. Moses had been commanded the people. The people heard it from Moses already. It didn't need it to be in the tablets. And they broke the law before it even came down from the mountain uh, the first time. And yet, here's God only two chapters later saying, Moses, come on back up the mountain. I'm going to do this again. We're going to do this again. We're going to write the tablet down again. We're going to have we're going to have these this law again for the people. And why are we skipping chapter 33? Why? What's in there that just we just ignored? Um, Does that have anything to do with the story of what the uh, question there's, you're raising? There's the tent where Moses sets it up and God is there. And it kind of, it chapter 33 just kind of continues to establish the relationship between Moses and God. God keeps okay. talking to Moses. Moses keeps talking to God. There's a famous okay here where Moses says you know God help me out let me know who you are and let me see you face to face and and God says uh you can't see me face to face anybody who does dies so I'll hide you in a cleft of a rock and I'll pass by so you can see me as I passed by and that's where chapter 33 ends Moses okay is hidden in a rock as God passes by 
but yeah, Chris, I just, I took it out of the, the study just because it, it didn't advance. It, it, it was just kind of in, an interlude of Moses and God kind of interaction between the two of them. Okay. So, so God offers a second set of the law and why would God do this? We can only say because God gives second chances, right? So what happens in why in verses six and seven? He's describing himself. Where does this happen? Top of the mountain. Um, On the top of, yeah. God's hanging out in a cloud and yeah. amongst Moses. Yeah. And and the Lord, by the way, when we see it in our Bibles, capitalize L O R D, it's the Hebrew name for God that we translate Yahweh. It's a holy name in the in the uh, Jewish faith um but this is not like in our bible sometimes it says god that's a common name uh l probably this is yahweh it's a different name and it has a special meaning um the best translation i can think can come up with for yahweh is the lord of presence so um why that's special is that it describes Yahweh as actually here, whereas other gods were often distance. Um, this the Israelites' God is different because God is with them. So when when God describes God's self to Moses, God begins by saying God's name twice, like saying, "I am present. I am here." And then God goes on to talk about what, what that means and what God is. Um, interestingly, there's one little translation um, in verse 7. God keeps steadfast love. Some Bibles translate it for thousands. I think it's helpful to read it as for the thousandth generation. Oh, okay. Because that's the more accurate understanding of what we're talking about. So God's steadfast love continues for a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, yet by no means clearing the guilty, by, but visiting the iniquity of the parents upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So, Chris, I'm wondering if, is this a, I don't know, like proof text of that there is generational sin i think this definitely supports that opinion and for those who are unfamiliar with this term uh what marcy's using generational sin is that sin that doesn't just affect one generation it affects generation upon generation so this will be about the only place that this shows up in our bible study but to look forward to sunday when we talk about stewardship of creation decisions made in one generation impact future generations. So if I have a chemical plant on the Hudson River and I decide just to discharge my chemicals into the river, that could have been totally legal at the time. But three generations mm -hmm. later, the river has no fish. And so that that is a an impact that happens that that affects generations that that people were not thinking about that when they did that, or even maybe they were. Mm -hmm. But you think of, um, you know, studies have shown that incarcerated parents are more likely to have incarcerated children. And let's put aside whether there's justice in our, our jail system and that kind of thing. The idea that when, when you take parents out of the house with incarceration, it's more likely to lead to those kind of things down the road. So it's not just somebody who did something. Um, it impacts their future generations too, right? Just as though this is a proof text for generational blessing. So the, the, it's not just sin that translates down the road. It's the good stuff too. It's when parents raise children by an example of trying to help them correct something, but reminding them, as Rick said earlier on, that they love them. 
you know, not doing it in a, in a way that, that hurts the children, perhaps, you know, that kind of thing. You raise a child to do that. They raise their children to do that all of a sudden in, you know, that can go on for generations. Um, if I plant a bunch of trees, a couple of generations later, my yard is going to be beautiful for the people who live there. You know, that's just kind of a, I'm not pointing that as sin or not, but, but just as our, our, just as bad decisions impact future generations, good ones can too. We think about people who designated parkland for public use and have committed funds to fund that. Two generations later, people use those parks and they say, how wonderful. Think about New York City and Central Park. If they hadn't carved that out in the middle of the city years ago, that would have been developed just like the rest of the city. But instead, there's this mm -hmm. bright spot of park in the middle of this huge city and it impacts people when i'm talking i i tie it back to environmental stewardship just because that's our overall theme it impacts people down the road for those kind of things too dick you had a comment i just wondered uh where the devil satan uh is in all of this stuff from doesn't seem there's any talk about the devils from the garden of eden where he persuades you know uh, all this things that she that she and he can do so, i mean i i could always say the devil made me do it but you can't do that in this these contexts so where is this uh, yeah there there's no there's no satan personified in this passage at all dick and there isn't in this part of the bible at all um mm -hmm. at this point we understand that that there's a condition that we're under that makes us for whatever reason, not fully invested in God's plan and makes us kind of turn away to our own. And, uh, you know, I think it's more, more rightly just called sin, a condition that we're, we're in rather than, uh, the people being tempted one way or the other, there wasn't like a time of ten temptation. They just said, ah, we'd like this. Um, mm -hmm. that was just the direction they kind of went in. Um, but again, okay. generationally, they had that option yeah. to turn away from God because it was passed down to them. Right. And yeah. I, I kind of like Dick, when, when you say like, Oh, the devil made me do it. I kind of see that as like, yeah. um, you know, God saying like, you did this, <laughs> like you yes. chose to do this. Um, it's, there's like no room for like a cop out, like, yeah. Oh, yeah. well, like it's not my <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like you, there's like a sense of ownership of, yeah, I did do this. The devil made me do it is the same as Aaron saying, I threw some gold in the fire and out came a calf. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> nice try. Yeah, yeah. So, and you would think that after the, all the things that threw that they would have a better, uh, better uh, reaction to what God wants. And he, he's done so much for them, even though there's problems and they still don't get it. And And that's, at some point, Dick, this is a story of God having proven God's faithfulness and steadfast love, having people still turning away from God. What is God to do? So what God had been doing isn't working. So what is God to do? We can disagree with it. I'm not saying that we have to accept it and say that was fair. But at some point, from God's perspective, we must ask, what does God do to try and get these people to wake up? Right. Well, not necessarily these people only, but he sends his son to take the sins away from and that's on our belief. So. That, that's part of the story, Dick, is that God knows that it's not going to work in the long run. And so God, God predetermines that there's going to be a need to be a bridge between humanity and God because of the, the divide that happens. So this has happened too. Mm -hmm. I want to point out there's some interesting things I just want us to notice as we as we conclude. Um, how does what happens in verse six and seven, what God says about God's self, how is that hopeful? And how is it also a caution for us? Well, it's hopeful in that God describes himself as compassionate, gracious, and slow to anger. So that's hopeful. Contrary to what he told Moses before, is that I'm going to wipe everybody out. That didn't seem too slow to anger. 
but, yeah, but God's already been living with these people for 40 years in the wilderness, Rick. So, I mean, yep. you know, you can only last so long in, on God's behalf. So, so God says, God's steadfast love extends to the thousands or the thousandth generation. But God visits justice on the iniquity to the third and fourth generation too. Now, that seems the caution. Like, we can't just turn away from God. It will have consequences. But I want you to note that God's justice seems to play a part in the bigger picture of God's mercy, not the other way around. So if God's steadfast love was visited on the third to the third and fourth generation, but God's justice to the thousand, that would establish that God's character is ultimately just and vengeful. But this shows us that God's justice happens within God's larger picture of mercy. And to that, again, still hard to swallow, but we can understand how God means for this to be a corrective not an ultimate punishment and a separation. You don't have to, to, to agree with how it happens, but that's what God seems to be revealing about God's self. Yes, Chris. When he uses the word generations, um, is he... Mm, that word to me mean, means a specific group of people, like my family's generation. I can name who those are. What about everybody else in the world in the cosmos? What if he's if he's saying I'm bringing this dual um, approach? to generations. Is it just to the Israelites? I mean, you could probably make that argument right now, Chris, that, that at this point in the people's history, it is just the Israelites. But I think when we look back at it through the lens of Christ, as Dick has helped us think about, we think about generations literally as, you know, parents to offspring to offspring and it, it extends out way beyond one tribe or people. So at this time, it ex, it's, it's the generation of Israelites. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it, it will come to include people not of that specific group. Okay. So we're about at time. So I just want us to wrap up by uh, looking. I, I said, how does the episode of the giving of the Ten Commandments twice demonstrate the love of God, the justice of God, and the grace of God. Because we're at time, I'll just give you where I'm going with that. God offers God's commandments to help the people live righteously. That's a love act. They break the commandments before they can even get them written in stone. God punishes them. That's an act of justice. But then God reinstitutes the law again with the people after that which you can see it as merciful or gracious in the long run. And then finally, and I'm not gonna answer this one, this is just questions for us to reflect on as we depart. How have your previous actions impacted later in your life, your life, one for the better or two for the not better? So how have actions you've done previously in your life impacted you later for both the positive and negative? How does God seem to react to us when we turn away? And for this, I'm going to tell you, rarely do I say this, but try and try and think of God in, God in human terms. How, how would your parent react to you when you try and turn away? How, how do we think about God in that way? And finally, what motivation do we have to follow God? Uh, if God ultimately is gracious, what's our motivation to, to not... To, to follow God, even if we know ultimately God's going to be gracious to me, um, no matter what I do. So those are some questions I leave for you to ponder. Um, I hope everybody was able to hear and see things okay today. And yes, it was um, great. 
I don't know how we'll continue to do things in the days to come. Uh, certainly, if Fellowship Hall doesn't have heat, we're not meeting in Fellowship Hall. <laughs> but um, as the rates go up around us, too, we have to be aware of that. Um, frankly, we might just decide that Zoom is easier for us to see and hear um, for all of those involved. Now, of course, there are some folks who aren't with us today, um, maybe because they don't have internet access. So that's a, that would be a concern as well. But we'll keep working on it. And uh, I would just encourage you to check your emails on Monday and Tuesday to see what's coming up on Wednesday. We will definitely have the Zoom option. It might be the only thing that we're doing is all I'm saying uh, for the weeks to come. So thanks for joining us for the study. And we'll hope to see you again soon. Um, Marcy, will we be doing a study next week? I was planning on it. Okay. So next Wednesday is the day before Thanksgiving and Marcy's preaching. So that's why I'm turning it to her. So we'll plan to see it next week at 10 a.m. It might be on the computer. It might be in person. Okay. And this coming Sunday is when we bring our pledges in or is it the yes. following Sunday? This Sunday. Oh, this Sunday, uh, you can bring your pledges into church or from one to two o'clock, we'll be out in the back parking lot and you can drive through for to see folks and uh, drop your pledges off then. So either way, whichever one you prefer. But yes, if you have pledge cards, you can turn them back in uh, this Sunday. Okay. Okay. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for joining. Chris, yeah. can you stay on for a second? I have a question for you. Me too. <laughs>